The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the chapter 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found this coin that I have lost. You saw, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Today I would like to invite you for a moment of silence in memory of the 21st anniversary of the death of 3,000 plus victims of the 2001 9-11 international terrorist attack to the Twin Towers in the New York City and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. And we know now that 300 thousand more people after the terrorist attack has been affected somehow, those few responders, those the family of those who die. And I think a moment of silence to honor their memory will be appropriate this morning. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you because you are our hope, our light, our salvation. Come to us as you always do. Speak to us. Open our ears, our hearts to you who come and work. that we may nurture our faith and live lives worth of children of God. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our title today for our sermon, it is The 99 in the Wilderness. The 99 in the Wilderness and is taken verbatim of today's gospel reading. The purpose of our 
reflection today, our sermon, intends to explore Jesus' parable, known as the lost sheep, from the perspective of the Pharisees and the scribes who criticized Jesus for welcoming and associating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus' interpretation of the parable moves in the direction of identifying the Pharisees and the scribes with the 99 sheep left in the wilderness. When Jesus claimed that, quote, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance, end quote. I would like to uh, have four main movements within our sermon today. Uh, the first one will be a religious landscape of the first century Palestine of Jesus, um, especially talking about scribes and Pharisees. Uh, the second one is going to be actually uh, dissecting the parable, some, fa some facts that we can see in the story of the parable. The third movement will be what Jesus, how Jesus interpreted this parable to his listeners. And then the last movement, it will be what does it mean for us today? <laughs> what could it mean for us, this parable? Especially if we uh, change the focus from the lost sheep to the 99 in the wilderness. So, first century landscape, especially the religious landscape, it is given to us by um, Cla um, Flavius Josephus. He is a first century historian, Jewish, more or less contemporary with Jesus, a little later, but he knew about Jesus. And he describes the religious landscape of Jesus' world, uh, talking about four philosophies or movements, religious movements. He talked about the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, or Essenes, and the Zealots. So that was kind of the choices in the menu of religious beliefs in Jesus' time. So you could be a Pharisee, you could be a Sadducee, you could be an Essene, or you could be a Zealot. Or most people will be a combination of all of them. <laughs> We'll focus mostly on one, but we'll take some other teachings from all of the others. Now, some of the historical background of the um, scribes, first of all, it will be that uh, probably they came to be an important uh, you know, group of people after the Babylonian captivity, um, roughly 6th century of, uh, before Christian era. And uh, Ezra is one example of, uh, you know, after the Babylonian captivity, you know, later under the Persian rule, um, the uh, Hebrews or the Jewish people came back to the Holy Land, rebuilt the temple, and while rebuilding the temple, you know, they found a scroll of the law, which basically was the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. So Ezra started this movement of putting a lot of attention on how to preserve how to copy, how to do manuscripts that will become available through all the uh, people where Jewish people, all the lands where Jewish people inhabited at that time. So they start a movement of people who knew how to learn and how to write and read, and that um, very influential later and especially in Jesus' time. Now, only the high priest in the Judaism and Jewish tradition, in the Jewish tradition could interpret the Torah of the book of the law. He was the only one who had the authority to do it, but he had to surround himself with people who knew how to read, how to copy manuscripts, and later how to interpret those manuscripts. So eventually, you know, the authority of the high priest to interpret the scriptures was chair at least, or was left in the hands of the scribes, or learned people, a body of people that could really preserve and could give custody and to uh, make copies available for all the synagogues across the empires and where they inhabited the lands. And then uh, eventually they became very influential people, as you might guess. Now, um, what about the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees have a little later development, especially probably in the second century before the Christian era. And to their credit, they have a very sad, painful experience as a group of people within Judaism. Once again, Flavius Josephus tells us the story of 
Alexander Jonathan Janai, a Jewish leader who in uh, a civil war of six years in Judah, who was 93 to 88 BC, and I'm going to quote what he says. At a feast to celebrate his victory, had 800 of his leading opponents in Jerusalem crucified alive, an act of cruelty unknown in Israel. It is very probable, probably that many and perhaps most of the victims were Pharisees. So by Jesus' time, Pharisees have really taken an attitude of um, withdrawal from the public arena. In fact, the word Pharisee means to separate, be separated. More precisely, self-separated. So Pharisees become a group that really have a fresh memory of how painful uh, they, they were treated by other Jews in a civil war, you know, and perhaps they have a good reasons to separate themselves from other groups, especially religious groups within Judaism. Now, the distinctive feature of the Pharisees was the detailed decisions of religious law, not only because, you know, they rely on the written Torah, or the scriptures or the scrolls, but they start integrating the oral tradition. That later became, of course, written too. But they talk about the principle of the fencing of the law. So they thought that the law needed to be, of course, interpreted for people in their time. So they say that the oral tradition had the same authority than the written Torah. That was a principle of the Pharisees brought to Judaism of Jesus' time. So they talk about that the, when God gave the Torah to Israel, gave the, the written Torah, but I gave the oral tradition that has the same authority than the written law. That was distinctive of Pharisees. So there is no wonder that um, in the time of Jesus, the portrait of the Pharisees and the scribes in the gospel is negative. They are Jesus' main antagonists who question Jesus' teachings and actions with respect to the Jewish tradition of the Torah and the temple. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, is titled, for some, you know, in, from, from, in some versions of the Bible, the woes to the scribes and the Pharisees was the most severe criticism Jesus pronounced against anybody. In Jesus' indictment, scribes and Pharisees were a religious party of hypocrites, pretty much with all due respect, I don't intend to insult anybody here or those who listen this um, online, but a, much a group of what we call today, or some people we call Bible thumpers in today's world. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defined a Bible thumper. Yes, it is there in the dictionary. You can find it. <laughs> it, is, it is an aggressively zealous advocate of Christian fundamentalism. So that's more or less the parallel portrait of the Pharisees in Jesus' time to today's Bible thumpers. Now let's move to the parable itself, to the story of the parable. You have heard every angle and wide range of interpretations of this parable. I'm sure most of them are appropriate and meaningful. Yes, this parable is about the relentless love of God for sinners. It is about the joy in heaven and earth when a sinner repents. And it is about Jesus welcoming, loving, and redeeming those rejected by society and their religious institutions. Today's sermon brings the questions of the 99 in the wilderness and their role on this parable. Some questions I will ask you to consider is, how would scribes and Pharisees hear and interpret this parable? What did Jesus intend to proclaim about the kingdom of God by means of this parable? Why is it important for us to explore scriptures and Jesus' teachings from different perspectives? Now, some basic facts in this parable. Number one, 
there is one flock of a hundred sheep in the story. Both the lost sheep and the 99 in the wilderness belong to the same flock. Now, this is important to interpret this parable. There is only one flock. Okay? Number two, the lost sheep got astray or away from the correct path or direction and may be of no fault in their own. That's interesting to consider. We always have the tendency to blame somebody who is missing the mark, <laughs> who is going in different direction. We always have the tendency to say, blame them and say, it's their fault. You know, not necessarily. You know, they just took a wrong direction. They just, we don't know the reason. So there's a fact there. The lost sheep just get away from the correct path and direction. Number three, the 99 sheep in the wilderness seems to be in the right path and direction. This is important about the Pharisees. Not only they thought they were in the right path, some of them really were in the right path, in the right direction. No, all Pharisees were equal. We know that. Generalizations are wrong. So we cannot put in the umbrella of the bad people or the Pharisees. So some of them really were in the right path and direction. Number four, the 99 sheep were left in the wilderness probably trusting that they will stay in the right path and direction. Okay, they were left there in the wilderness trusting that they will not get lost. Number five, the shepherd cares for the whole flock. Each one of the sheep, it is important and worth taking the risk of losing more sheep to seek and find just one who have been lost. Now, let me offer you Jesus' interpretation, some points that Jesus could tell to us about this parable. In God's, in God's flock, there is room for scribes, Pharisees, Yes, tax collectors and sinners. All people are welcome to the kingdom of God. How do you think this ring in the ears of the Pharisees and the scribes? Probably not so nice. Probably not so welcoming. Number two, the risk of taking the wrong path is real for all people of God, but overwhelmingly higher for those who know the path but choose to ignore it. Number three, joining the party of the Pharisees and the circle of the scribes, which means self-separate, break up, move apart, divide from God's flock, is not an option for the shepherd and shouldn't be an option for the 99 sheep in the wilderness either. Number three, tax collectors and sinners shouldn't be abandoned for they have taken, for, for they have taken the wrong path. For the right path is not about self-righteousness and self-separation, but about God's love and God's commitment to seek and find those who have taken a grown path. Number four, tax collectors and sinners are welcome into the kingdom of God. Pharisees and scribes may have no need for repentance right then in a point or season of their lives but they have taken a grown path when they self-separate from, reject, and condemn tax collectors and sinners. God's people, God's flock, God's kingdom belongs to God, and we cannot own God's people for the same reason we cannot own God. God is not private property. We cannot lease or buy God, nor God's people either. The more joy expression of Jesus refers to the reality that God's flock, it is in real trouble, not because one lost sheep who is committed to seek and find, but because the 99 in the wilderness have taken the grown path and become lost. Then instead of seeking and finding a single one lost sheep, now Jesus is going to seek and find 99 and the vast wilderness of religious belief, social institutions, and political parties. Therefore, 
The lost sheep is not only a parable of one lost sheep in God's flock. That really will be an easy task for Jesus. But about 99 in the wilderness who continue being sought and found by the shepherd of the flock. This is even more challenging considering that the 99 in the wilderness believe and act as if they are in the right path and direction. The one lost sheep know and accept being in the wrong path, repents, and is willing to, embrace, to be embraced by God's grace and get back to the right path in going in the right direction. What does it mean for us, all of this? In closing, parable literally means to set besides, to compare, to compare. And it was a preferred teaching method of Jesus in this sense, a well-known story of a real-life event or situation, like shepherding a flock, was used to teach how the kingdom of God was like. The interpretation of, of this parable, which usually points to a single truth in the kingdom of God, does not require to seek for and find meaning in every detail of the story. But when something in the story is mentioned more than once, Usually, it is a hint that points to the truth of the story. The purpose of this parable in Jesus' teaching, it is to cause a shocking reaction and invite to a reverse in thinking and action that challenges what we think we know about the kingdom of God. In today's parable, 99 appears twice, 99 in the wilderness, and 99 righteous persons who need not repentance. Therefore, the lost sheep parable does not only point out to what is self-evident and we know regarding God's relentless love for a lost sheep, but to the 99 in the wilderness who have rejected the lost ones, tax collectors and sinners, and by doing so, they have taken the wrong path and are going in the ground direction. Just because of that, well, it matters for Jesus. Finally, the scribes and Pharisees and their modern successors are making God's work more difficult. And we all can become members of that party of 99 in the wilderness at any time, unless we commit ourselves to continue trusting in the grace of God following the path of the one who declared, quote, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God bless you.